Well, welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Joe O'Keefe. I'm the Associate Dean at the Lynch School of Education. And this is the third in our series of four presentations, discussions related to the church in the 21st century that is sponsored by the Lynch School of Education. Uh, we began by looking at the spiritual and psychological impact of sexual abuse uh, in October. Uh, we then had a seminar on the role of women and girls in the church uh, in de December. Um, on April 10th, uh, Dr. Joe Kelly from Merrimack will be with us, a theologian who will talk about hope uh, in these difficult days. And tonight we have the opportunity to take advantage really of expertise that we have within the Lynch School to help us think about ways in which we can teach children about sexual safety in a way that is appropriate for them, uh, in a way that um, is consonant with the mission of Catholic schools as community. Uh, and to lead us in our thinking tonight are two very qualified uh, members of our faculty, I think, who will bring us a lot of food for thought and will stimulate a lot of interesting discussion. Uh, Professor Mary Walsh from our Department of Counseling Psychology um, has done extensive work, especially in ways in which schools and within schools how various service providers, teachers, counselors, uh, social workers together can work to remove the barriers to learning and to create schools that are safe environments. And Dr. Walsh's work is noted nationwide and has received much acclaim for her work in reforming schools to really make them healthy places for children. Uh, joining her is Dr. Michelle Montavon, uh, who joined our faculty uh, this past September in our Department of Teacher Education Curriculum and Instruction. And Dr. Montavon uh, is an expert on health education. Um, and she brings her education degree, her doctorate from Columbia in education, but combined with her professional experience and history as a nurse. Uh, she has also taught in Catholic high schools and has done a lot of work also in public education. Uh, and so she brings the experience of being a Catholic school teacher uh, to our conversation tonight. So welcome. To all of you who are here, uh, we'll have our discussion until 8.30 or so, and then the conversation can continue across in Campion Hall, where we will have a reception for you all. So thank you for coming out on this cold night. And uh, Dr. Montavon and Dr. Walsh, thank you for being part of our session. Well, again, let me add my thanks to your uh, coming out tonight. It's really... Uh, a challenge these days with the, uh, the winter that we're having, isn't it? Um, Mary and I want to uh, do three things, so we have three objectives tonight. Um, we want to describe, first of all, a comprehensive approach to um, ensuring the safety and healthy development of children in, in the school setting. Um, we want to raise awareness of the challenges to schools in implementing a comprehensive approach. Um, and in the, in, in the context of that, we'd, we'd really like to have a discussion, a dialogue with you um, around some of the issues that we raise. And we finally want to, recognizing that the challenges are there, we want to encourage collaborative efforts uh, across schools, in, uh, across Catholic schools uh, in the archdiocese, as well as um, the community and uh, ourselves, Boston College, to address the student and family needs and developing a comprehensive approach to sexual abuse prevention. We want to begin um, by, <coughs> I guess it's in the wrong place. That was supposed to be our title slide. <laughs> um, but we want to begin, because it's really important, um, to look at uh, def the definition of uh, sexual abuse in the context of child abuse. Um, and in general, the National Committee for the Prevention of Child Abuse uh, in 1989 defined um, or identified four uh, components of child abuse, and they're physical abuse, emotional abuse, uh, sexual abuse, and neglect. Uh, and it's important to put this in context as we then uh, look at, at a comprehensive approach. The definition of abuse, that is the uh, large category of child abuse, 
um, that we you have, see in front of you is from the Mass Department of Social Services. As you know, that's the agency in Massachusetts uh, that's responsible for child protection. That's where all of the reports go from schools and other institutions uh, when there's allegations of abuse. Uh, and as you can see, uh, their definition of abuse is uh, fairly broad. Uh, it's any action that creates a substantial injury or risk of injury to a child. Uh, and they go on to say abuse can be physical, sexual, or, or emotional. Um, and you can, you can see the, uh, the rest of, of that definition. Now, the Department of Social Services then defines sexual abuse. And as you can see, they define sexual abuse very broadly. This is an area, um, and you look across states, where some of the problems have come in is when sexual abuse is not defined clearly. And there aren't clear parameters, particularly for uh, teachers and other professionals working in agencies. For the Department of Social Services here in our state, this is their, their definition. Uh, uh, and as you can see, fairly broad. And they finally, they end with sex, sex between an adult and child is never consensual. Um, so they clearly state uh, sort of the broad uh, spectrum here of uh, what the definition entails. Now, in, in the context of um, child sex, sexual abuse uh, reporting and even our response to child sexual abuse, the, um, uh, the, there are aspects of child sexual abuse that make understanding uh, and response difficult. And as you can see here, um, there are a number of issues um, that, um, of course, cause difficulty. Uh, the term covers, first of all, a wide range of behavior. Um, and as you can see from the definition, it's very broad. Um, the offenders, and this is, this, uh, is um, of particular concern to teachers, the offenders can often be uh, family members or strangers. So there is a wide, uh, um, you know, there, there are a number of people uh, that can uh, sexually abuse a child. The acts of abuse vary in nature, they vary in frequency, they vary in intensity, and they vary in duration. Um, the uh, sexual abuse occurs in private. It's generally under a cloak of secrecy. Um, and as we'll see as we begin to talk about curriculum and prevention, we'll talk about the issue of um, asking children uh, and uh, helping children sort of disclose and break that secret secrecy. Um, Sexual abuse often, there's no physical signs of abuse. You don't, you don't see um, uh, anything with the child. Um, not always, but often. Um, victor, victims are of different ages. They're in different stages of cognitive, physical, and emotional development. And Mary will talk about that uh, in detail. Um, sexual abuse is really an emotional topic. Uh, in the school system in, in which I worked for about 11 years, um, we spent a great deal of time uh, on our sexual abuse prevention policy and then our practices. Um, and, but in the context of doing that, what we, uh, what we needed to do was to work very closely together because there were often lots of issues and difficulties that arose in terms of working across disciplines with different adults in the school setting. Um, there's a lot of emotion and urgency uh, that's heightened because it's children, and our responsibility is to protect children. Um, and finally, it involves sex. Uh, and as you know, or you know, from from my perspective, uh, our American <coughs> society hasn't done very well with the topic of sex and talking about sex and sexuality education in schools. Uh, so our, our comfort zone around uh, sexuality and sexuality issues, uh, it, particularly in terms of developing policies and public policies, is, uh, is, is particularly difficult. So taking all of this, 
putting this into context, you can see how difficult it is. Um, and how, uh, you know, if you look across lot, uh, lots of the research that has been done with regard to sexual abuse prevention, you see that there are starts and stops, and there isn't a lot of uh, a detail um, that has been worked on. And we'll, we'll go into that in more specifics. I think what you see here is the complexity of the issue. And um, it's good to remember that this is complex for everybody. It's not just the Catholic Church that's struggling with these issues. We're struggling in a particular way right now, but this has been a struggle for a long time in every institution. And it took public schools a long time to develop policies. Um, everyone has struggled because it's such a complicated issue. The Federation on Child Abuse and Neglect in 1992 uh, made a statement, and this is only partially, it's only partial uh, statement, but I thought it was important to start with um, in terms of talking about the protection of children in school settings. And what they defined, uh, what they talked about is schools representing community islands of safety, where teachers um, and other staff in the school um, are vested with authority to guide children. Um, as an, and they go on to say, as in all other areas where public trust is granted, there's potential for the abuse of that trust and appropriate safeguards have to be mandated. Um, in fact, just to, to veer from that a, a bit, once mandated reporting statutes were implemented in states, the change in terms of reporting and the response um, has been significant, and you can see that in terms of some of the studies that have been done. There's been many, a great deal of reporting once mandates were in place. Um, but they go on to say, such safeguards would protect children from abuse and also protect adults from unwarranted or frivolous allegations. And Mary and I thought that as we uh, began this uh, sort of conversation with you, it would be really important to talk about the context of schools and the community of schools and what it is that, uh, what are the elements in a school community that provide for the protection and development of children. Um, I just sort of veer from this a little bit. I have a friend in health education and she likes to describe um, children as uh, she try, likes to describe sort of this safety net that we provide for children in schools um, in sort of a, a really interesting way. She asks people to visualize a child jumping on a trampoline and how all of us as adults want that child to be able to jump as high as they can and to develop in the best way uh, possible. And she talks about the fact that that trampoline also presents risk because, of course, the child can jump too far one way and fall or create, you know, have problems there. And what she talks about is the fact that all of us in schools or in institutions that work with children, that we need to draw or we need to all stand around that trampoline and hold hands um, across disciplines to protect children. Um, and, it's, and it's really a great image in terms of thinking about the importance of adults and their responsibility to children. So what we'd like to do is to ask all of you a question. What are the elements that you feel um, within a school community that you feel need to be in a school community that create a safe and health promoting and climate environment for, um, for children? So we'll give you a few minutes to respond to us on that. Maybe you could talk to each other for a few minutes. Maybe in pairs. Yes? I think the first thing that comes to my mind is the, um, the issue of bullying, which seems to be getting a lot of play lately. Um, and the fact that school is so poorly addressed that. 
in terms of um, teaching the children to respect for one another and respect for the differences among children. And it seems as though the weakest kids across the board get, get this kind of news. And they seem to get it year after year after year. So the element that, um, in that case, protects children is, there are a couple that you mentioned. One is respect for each other. And another, just a little bit different, respect for the differences in each other. Yeah, I just, I don't, I don't see that in a lot of cases mm -hmm. that faculty uh, thinks that um, faculty address that in an open and straightforward and structured way. Um, with children. So um, another element might be yeah. the teaching faculties or the, the staffs addressing the issue of Yeah, bullying. I think schools have avoided that, the whole business of um, ethical behavior and morality and so on and so forth because that seems to be loaded mm -hmm. and um, and so they've, they've sort of left the kids to, to mm -hmm. fend for themselves. And, uh, some other thoughts? The people that have just spent 24 hours straight <laughs> in training probably have this memorized. <laughs> Doctor, we recognize the definitions. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you do. For the tiny bit better, we put the, ne the neglect was put in, so we had pins as the uh, physical, emotional neglect and sexual, just uh, so that we had something the to... acronym. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as principal of school, and this is my vice principal here, I think that we, um, the first thing I look at is the faculty, to see how devoted they are in caring about the children, because to me, they're key. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and I'm very fortunate to have that kind of a staff. <clears throat> the other thing is the programs that, I uh, know we're, we're responding now, to a situation, but we have had programs in place for a number of years, um, you know, with the, the religion curriculum and what has been, and even to go back as far as Cardinal Medeiros, he, he quote, mandated um, the family life programs. And so they've been in place. Now they're not as comprehensive, but they are spiraling so that you begin with the, the uh, kindergarten children with just um, the safety issues of touches and things like that, which makes you feel comfortable. So, I mean, I, I really feel that in many respects that those are real key elements. Mm -hmm. And then now that we are ch challenged and mandated and whatever to go much more in depth, I think that we are there, that basis is there for a number of us. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know where other people are coming from, but I think the staff and the programs and then the um, monitoring of it uh, and the policies. And I think the policies are key so that the parents are aware, the teachers are aware, and that they all work together. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the respect and the um, request that teachers address the, um, as you put it, the ethical behavior. You're saying a caring faculty, um, programs or curricula such as the family life program that actually teach these kind of social, interpersonal skills very directly, and then school policies around um, abuse and reporting of abuse. Any others? Yes. I come from a public school uh, background, and um, uh, I would say amen to the focus on, on teachers. Um, it seems to me that what needs to go along with that is a commitment of the community and uh, certainly of the administration to making sure that the teacher uh, is working with the proper number of students so that the teacher is able within a class period and, and after a class to observe the behavior of, of students, to recognize 
uh, is not so overwhelmed by numbers mm -hmm. that it's unlikely that the teacher will mm -hmm. uh, will recognize. Mm -hmm. I think that um, a very close relationship between the teaching staff and the and the counseling staff is important. That the counselors see themselves as supporting teachers and students, um, and all three. Uh, working together for uh, the kind of climate that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, the only thing that comes to mind um, for me is that what it seems <laughs> logical. Um, is that it's, it seems to me the one of the hardest things is to allow the children to feel safe when someone has, whether it's a child or whatever, they need to feel safe um, in going to an adult. And the peer pressure is so strong or the child is so afraid that um, if something were put into effect where a child um, naturally talks on a one-to-one -one basis with an adult, mm -hmm. so that when the problem comes up, there's already that structure there. Even if, I mean, it's sort of the big sister program, but mm -hmm. I don't know what they do in the, in the schools, but a child has to feel comfortable talking with an adult before they're going to talk to anyone about. Exactly whatever a boy did or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, it has to be pre-established. Mm -hmm. What you're describing um, are programs in schools that um, either now deal with mentoring, adult mentoring of young people, uh, sometimes there's, as the children get into middle school and high school, there's advisor, advisee programs. I remember working in um, the Catholic high schools, and, you know, as a teacher, and my responsibility as a homeroom teacher was to have a group of students and really work with them across academic, social, emotional kinds of issues. Uh, and so th those are the kinds of things sort of in a more formal way that I think you're talking about that really have actually some very positive um, effects in terms of students. Yeah. And I think somehow that, that, when that is formal, yep. a lot of kids aren't going to want to go. It's only That's mm -hmm. an interesting distinction. Yeah. I think some of this um, we're currently beginning to think about and address through